I'm really thrilled to moderate this conversation. It's a conversation that I certainly came across in researching my book, and it's one that's near and dear to my heart, both as a former patient and as someone trying to sort of chronicle advocacy and science in the breast cancer space. Um, so I, you know, Kathy talked about kind of there being these two sides, sort of this early stage um, community and the metastatic community. And yes, as she said, we're here to talk about allyship and kind of building bridges between these um, communities. And of course, there are a lot of differences um, between early stage disease and the experience of it and metastatic disease, both scientifically and psychologically. Um, but there's also so much crossover and commonality. Um, we know that something like uh, as many as one third of early stage breast cancer patients will see their disease recur. And we also know that most metastatic breast cancer patients were once early stagers. Um, and so, you know, this is something well understood in the oncological community, um, but there's a lot of misconceptions uh, in the, uh, even in the patient community. And I wondered if we could start off by just talking a little bit about what did you ladies know um, about early stage versus metastatic disease? What did you kind of know about these terms and what they meant and sort of the landscape um, when you began um, your experience uh, personally with breast cancer? So I wanted to ask you, Jersey, you've been living with metastatic breast cancer for some time. Um, and the bio, it says nine years um, that you've been living with um, the disease. And so I just was curious, what did you know about metastatic breast cancer before your own diagnosis? And could you share a little bit about that? Because I'm sure that uh, you have a lot in common with some of a lot of the people who are watching the webinar and, and folks out there. Thank you, Kate. Um, I was diagnosed in 2003 with DCIS and I had not heard the word metastatic. Never knew what stage four meant. Um, I never heard it until I actually became metastatic myself in 2011. And when you heard that word, did what, what came to your mind? Like what, what were sort of your initial thoughts when you heard that word, not knowing a lot about uh, the illness? First, I couldn't pronounce the word. <laughs> um, now I can probably pronounce it and spell it backwards and say it backwards. Um, I didn't know that, I knew that there were four stages, but I didn't really know that you could only pass away from stage four. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that it was a, a, a whole different world from early stages to, to metastatic. I just thought breast cancer was breast cancer was breast cancer was breast cancer. Right. Yeah, and I think that's really common. I wonder, Marianne, you work so much with um, with all types of folks from the breast cancer community. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned, <laughs> um, both through your own personal experience and then from working with um, support groups and on Facebook um, with lots of uh, lots of patients in in sort of both categories? Absolutely, and thank you, Kate. So I had the same experience as Jersey, and I would say that you know when I was first diagnosed. I was told all the clinical definitions of the different stages, but it never was expressed to me that, oh, I could possibly, you know, progress into a later stage or that it was incurable, that once you become stage four, you're incurable, that those dots were never connected for me and I never connected them myself. And I see that also among the early stagers, maybe not thinking past, well, I have to get their chemo, which is understandable. I have to get the radiation. These are the things in front of me. And then being happy to say, I can walk away and I'm done now. And, and not thinking, well, what, what about someone else's experience who can't say that ever, that they're in forever treatment? Yes, yes. I think I had those experiences too um, early on, you know, and I think that connecting the dots from my personal experience was really important to understanding the whole universe of, you know, possibilities and things like that. For me, that that um, that was a helpful part of my experience to just kind of, you know, more fully understand. And I think, um, you know, increasing information and education and awareness is um, something, you know, is a goal of this webinar for sure. Um, Jean, you've been involved in advocacy for so long and advocacy has been so important over the decades in like, uh, making the public aware of, of breast cancer in um, making the public aware of patient experiences and then also really raising money and pushing the science forward. Um, I wondered if you could give us just like a fairly brief like little history snapshot of kind of the history of early stage advocacy and sort of why metastatic priorities were kind of not always front and center and sort of what's changed and in particular I think even the last five to ten years it's really been recent shift 
that I think is really important. I'd love for you to talk about that a little. Um, thank you, Kate. And it's great to be joined by um, these two amazing women. You know, I'll try to do a, what I can in, in quickly, but I think it's, you know, it's often hard for us to think about what it was like 10, 20, or just, or 30 years ago. But, you know, the breast cancer advocacy movement really began in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and prior to that, you know, I think for the most part, people were talking to each other, like through an informal network, but, you know, Komen didn't get started until the late 80s, um, the National Breast Cancer Coalition, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and many others were really the early 90s. And of course, the American Cancer Society was there and, you know, other of the big institutions. But I think that advocacy, like women finding their voice and really getting active was then. And if you think back 30 years ago, the treatments for metastatic breast cancer, sadly, were very, very few. We didn't have a lot of information about subtypes and targets and all these ways that make us now realize that breast cancer is not one disease and we fight it in lots of different ways. So women with metastatic were often told, you know, go home and get your affairs in order. Um, those with HER2 positive breast cancer, which I know is the disease that Kate had, um, had a particularly aggressive diagnosis. Um, some of those women literally chained themselves to the fence of Genentech when that when Herceptin was being developed to try to get access to that drug, and now that is the one, one of the most treatable subtypes um, for breast cancer. So so much has changed. Um, I think when the advocates got together, it was really about wanting to find voice, wanting to find more research, but also really putting forth this pink, positive women running. Uh, I think about all the races. Um, and I think there wasn't a lot of distinction. And I'll just end by saying, I just remember being interviewed uh, by someone in some radio station a couple of years ago. And he said to me, so tell me about this metastatic." So he couldn't pronounce it either. Is this a new kind of breast cancer? And I just thought, oh my God, this is the oldest breast cancer. This is the breast cancer that kills women and men. And you don't even know, we don't, the general public doesn't even know the word. So I think so much has changed um, in the last five years, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, I think one of the things I noticed in researching my book is how organized a lot of the metastatic advocates are and sort of getting that word, just that word um, into the public sphere more and to, you know, have, um, have it be fully understood both by patients and by advocates and by uh, folks who raise money and folks who are, you know, looking at scientific grants and, and just kind of putting that word um, a little bit more at the forefront. And we have seen a lot of the big ca uh, breast cancer groups and um, charities and advocacy groups uh, respond. Um, so it, in addition to LBBC, um, Komen and other groups have goals fo focused specifically on things like drug resistance and um, and re raising money for the biology, uh, biological um, mysteries that still surround a lot of um, metastatic breast cancer. Um, but I wondered if, um, so since we, and not to be too divisive by talking about a divide, um, but there is a little, there, there are echo chambers in breast cancer and there are, you know, kind of silos. And I wondered like, what are some of the, why, why don't all these groups work together as one in, in sort of like, it, what are some of the barriers to kind of bringing together, you know, to, to making early stage breast cancer patients comfortable and eager to talk to, um, uh, stage four breast cancer patients and vice versa. What are some of the, the barriers to kind of um, a, a more unified um, uh, kind of community? Jersey, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You've been in both places. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Uh, what are some barriers? Well, one of the barriers is, is just the, um, the vocabulary. I mean, when you're first diagnosed, if you're not introduced to the word metastatic, um, you know, not to scare anyone, but you know, just words that like the doctors can like tell you in the, in the different subtypes. Like I didn't even really know about subtypes until like I became an advocate in, in stage four and they're like, what's your subtype? And I'm like, what? Like, no, we're all one, but, but we're not. It's not all just one. So just like, just different words. Like even like um, I was saying like palliative care, I just started palliative care like 
this year, but I've been metastatic for nine years. If you just introduce those words like softly and gently. And so when you do hear it, you're not like, what the, you know, cause that's how I was. I was like stage four. And then I was just like, oh, like, oh, like that's like, oh. <laughs> so if you just introduce this and you know, like, and I'm sure like the early stage as the early stage, I probably wouldn't want to engage with someone that was metastatic. I mean, because I would be like, why? You know, when you're early stage, you're, you're, you're waiting to get to that five year mark so you can celebrate um, I'm cancer free. So I think as um, metastatic patients, it's up to us to, to reach across the aisle and embrace an early stager and, you know, just support them, you know, don't scare the daylights out of them. But um, unfortunately, I feel like some metastatic people are, are, some of us are mean and we should be embracing them and, and, and loving them and, you know, sharing our knowledge. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely some tension uh, sometimes in the community, right? Over, you know, stage four needs more is a big hashtag on Twitter and, you know, this movement to try to get more attention from the media, from scientists, from advocacy groups um, to the community in part to do, you know, there, there's, I mean, one of the things I learned in my book is there's so much interesting science we still haven't done yet um, about metastatic disease. But Jean, I'm really glad you mentioned her, her septin <clears throat> because I was thinking that there haven't been that many huge breakthrough drugs in breast cancer, but the ones that we have, um, all of them um, started uh, as experimental treatments for women with metastatic breast cancer, um, and then were proven um, to work and then filtered back, uh, you know, upstream um, to be used as treatments for early stage disease. Um, Herceptin for, is one of those drugs, um, tamoxifen, also Ibrance, which is a common drug now for women with metastatic um, estrogen fueled breast cancer and is filtering back um, perhaps upstream to, to be used as a treatment for early stage um, patients as well in some cases. Um, and so Marianne, I wondered um, in addition, I mean like everybody needs new drug development. This is a shared goal um, between the metastatic and early stage community. Um, Marianne, I wondered because you're in these groups and you know counseling folks, can you talk a little bit about uh, what other uh, shared goals or shared needs are there across these, um, these two communities? Or if you could talk a little bit, I mean, we want to stay positive, but also there is fear that Jersey mentioned there as well. This idea, like I'm early stage. I don't even want to know about, you know, the worst case scenario, a stage four diagnosis, um, but sort of what are the benefits of kind of um, building bridges across these two, uh, these two communities? Well, you know what, the, the two key barriers that I see are information and fear when it comes from the early stage perspective. And information is not always their fault. I think if practitioners were to take more time and talk with us about what does all of this mean? It's one thing to give me the clinical definition of stage four, but it's another thing to tell me, you know, that is a 30% chance that you become that, you know, and this is what we're going to be doing to help ensure it, as best we can that does not happen. And to help me understand, I did not realize that stage four was incurable. I knew that breast cancer patients could die. I didn't realize it was all stage four and that they were incurable. So um, I think that if we deal with just the fear right now, because that, that's enormous, right? And how do you, as an early stager, help yourself manage that, I think it's learning more. I think that knowledge will help calm your fear down and empower you to better understand, well, what is it out there? Otherwise, the fear is absolutely controlling you. And that's not what you want. And once you start to learn more, then as you calm down, you can realize, you know what, we're in this together. I, I may be stage one and jurors may be stage four, but it's, it is all breast cancer when it comes to who should be helping who. And we can each help each other. Jersey can help me understand things that I haven't been through yet. And I can help, you know, spread the word about metastatic breast cancer among other things, right? So I think there's a lot of power for us to come together and unite and say, we're all part of the breast cancer community. What can we do together? right? To, um, as my friend Erica says, to move some mountains, right? Because it, it takes a lot of power to do that, but together we can. 
Um, so just uh, just in, in let's do some education right now. We're all here. We've got a wonderful audience watching. Um, and Kathy uh, just passed me a question from um, uh, somebody uh, watching um, who asked, could you define what is palliative care? Um, this is a good question. Uh, and this is something folks should understand and Jersey certainly knows. Um, Jersey, can you just quickly uh, just tell us what does that mean and why is that something that's really important um, to uh, folks with metastatic cancer? So there's two things with palliative care. Um, sometimes at the end of your life, you go to palliative care, like, you know, to make you feel better um, while you're in hospice. But palliative care is also a pain management. Mm -hmm. So because I was having um, so much pain, and I think it was from the medicine and the doctor didn't know why, she recommended I go to palliative care so they can help me with the, the pain management of it. And me um, being stage four for nine years, I like lost it on the nurse because I'm like, first of all, I'm nine years in it. Right. I've been in pain before. And now you want to get send me to palliative care? So I knew what it was, but I'm like, I should have already been there. And also that should be one of those words that's in your vocabulary when you're first introduced to breast cancer. And another thing that will really help is if we just all talk about it more. Um, you know, early stages with metastatic, just have different conversations. Like, you know, this is how I feel or this is what this medicine did to me because I took tamoxifen and I took Ibrin. So, you know, talking about it and I mean, I'm not mad or angry at someone that's an early stager. You know, I'm not angry because I have stage four because why? I live life now and I'm going to live it till the wheels fall off. Um, and just and, and Can I jump in there? Is that okay? And um, yeah, just give a little bit more definition of palliative care. It's also called supportive care. Mm -hmm. And it's all about quality of life. And it is in addition to your curative team. It's not a replacement. So it right. doesn't mean that you're entering hospice. That's right. a huge misnomer about palliative care. And there are tons of studies that prove that if you offer it, early on at diagnosis or as early as possible, it makes your treatment more effective. It gives you a better quality of life and it can even extend your life. So Jersey is exactly right that it should be, it should have been offered to her at the get go. Mm -hmm. She becomes a metastatic. It, it should have been, you know, part of her in her toolkit as, as we like to say. Yeah. I just want to, and that's great. You both explained it so well. And, and, you know, at living beyond breast cancer, we've tried really hard to get the information out about palliative care. And it is often one of those things that no one wants to talk about. And there's so many, so many confusing and, and myths, but I just want to talk a little bit about sort of the mean or the angry mm. sense that we might have about some of the metastatic advocates, um, you know, living beyond breast cancer started the first advocacy conference. Um, I think it's 15 years ago, bringing advocate metastatic patients together to for an annual conference. And many of these groups formed at our conference because they hung out late at night, drinking and having fun and um, really realized, you know, met up and then met a viver and they met each other. But I think I always have to remember these people are, they are angry. They have a really serious disease at a time, for many of them at a time at their life where it was not at all expected. And they really are fighting for their lives at the same time, you know, trying to live their lives. So I, I think we all, we have to be compassionate in to them and then also compassionate to everybody with breast cancer, but it is a very dire situation. And I know for us at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, we often connect more with younger women who are living with metastatic mm -hmm. and um, and as well as all ages, but we know depending on when this disease hits you, um, it really is incredibly difficult to deal with and throws you outside of your peer group and just changes your, your future. Um, so I think as we, as we learn how to connect, it's compassion on both sides, which I think is what we're trying to do during this pandemic as well. <laughs> so good practice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that a, that a woman who's, I mean, I was 35 when I was diagnosed with early stage disease. It strikes me that a young woman with metastatic breast cancer may actually have more to talk about and more and, and th special things in common with an early stage young patient compared to 
say, a, you know, a, 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 another metastatic patient who's decades older um, that, you know, in thinking about, you know, there are all these commonalities by age, by stage, by subtype, by socioeconomic race status and all of these other ways we try to relate to one another. Um, but I think that's a really good point. And Jean, I'm glad you, you hopped in there because I was gonna ask you like, if we get down to brass tacks, what actually needs to happen here? I mean, facilitating conversations between um, men and women with metastatic breast cancer and men and women with early stage breast cancer is important and good. Um, but, you know, in terms of the sort of the larger world and the levers of power, um, kind of, can you talk a little bit about like, what would you like to see happen at the, um, you know, kind of funding scientific level, like, Brass tax, like where can we, where can the advocacy community sort of move? Um, yeah, I mean, there are so many places, but I think first and foremost, you, you know, some, I think there is this misconception that breast cancer is the good cancer to get like, oh, well you have breast cancer. That's so treatable. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to tell you guys that way too, we lose way too many people from breast cancer. So I think part of it is not just getting the media and our own social media to really show the reality of you know, breast cancer has never been a pink disease. It's always been an, a really ugly, challenging disease that takes away so much. So getting that reality out there, then obviously we need to continue to fight for funding on the federal level. We need to support organizations that are really making a difference. So be an informed uh, philanthropist, I always say, like, you know, do you want to help fund research? Do you want to provide support? Where do you want to put it? And you know, this is a long road. I mean, I really encourage all of you to read Kate's book um, because she goes back and really traces the whole history of, you know, a lot of things, but how did we get here in terms of treating breast cancer? And it has been slow and there have been a lot of missteps and, you know, Kate could highlight a few of them, but the only reason some things started changing, like the amount of surgery you got or how toxic your, your chemotherapy is, all kinds of things happened because women and men spoke up and pushed. And then there were some amazing researchers that made changes. So um, reading her book is an eye opener. I mean, we have, we, it took us a long time to get to where we are today. So I don't know, Kate, if you want to hit on a few of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like when people would ask me the takeaway from my book, I would say like, we have a long way to go. We're not there yet. I think there's like a perception in the public that this is, we there's so much pink. There's so many ribbons. Surely this is not a big deal anymore. So it's kind of blowing apart that notion, but also there has been tremendous progress and there's more progress every year. And I think Jersey, you're a living proof of so much of that. I, just in hearing you talk about palliative care, it's hard to sort of square that with how you look, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, and so I wondered if you could, could you talk, let's do a little more education here. Um, uh, and before I get to that, I just want to acknowledge a, a comment from the chat, which is someone, MJ says, a cure for metastatic breast cancer is a cure for breast cancer. Yes, right? Um, and there is, you know, even uh, people are entertaining these notions. Could we perhaps cure some metastatic breast cancer patients now, or at least get them into remission for long periods of time? So Jersey, can you tell, what do people misunderstand about metastatic breast cancer? Um, I'm sure you do a great deal of educating both your, you know, friends and family and your own personal community, and then through your, your professional work as well. What do people not understand about it? Um, that, that there is no cure and like, I thought you were in remission, like, so, you know, it's, it's always, I'll just say, well, I'll be on medicine the rest of my life, you know, mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, you know, so it's, it's bits and pieces. you have to give them, feed it to them by bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talked in kind of our pre-conversation a little bit about education, not just of early stage patients, that this is a possibility and that they should, you know, be aware that, you know, saying you're cancer free, you, you don't, you can never completely know that at the end right. of treatment. And that's why we're always waiting for years to pass, et cetera. But even that is, you know, really no guarantee. That's just you know, that's just some real talk, right? Um, but we also talked about sort of Im the importance of educating friends and family as well, a little bit more about metastatic disease, even friends and family of an early stage patient um, is really important um, to just, you know, get more information. And a lot of times it's incumbent on the 
patient to ask all of this stuff. Sometimes an oncologist won't say, okay, here's the possibility this will come back. Here's what we would do next time. Those are kind of not as common uh, conversations as perhaps they should be. And Marianne, I see you shaking your head and wanting to jump in. So please jump in. Uh, we've talked about a bunch of things in the last couple of minutes here. Yes, we have. Of course, without ever having chemo, I have chemo brain. So excuse me if I can't remember everything. But I think if we keep focusing on education and not assuming that just because someone has had a breast cancer diagnosis that they understand the metastatic experience. Absolutely. I think that's important and, and to be able to help them understand. And I think, you know, people are empathetic. So if someone is excited about ringing the bell, which in my group, they will post a lot, right? And they want us to celebrate, they probably don't understand the impact of that on someone with metastatic breast cancer. And we need to take the time and teach them. And, you know, they can have their celebrations, but they also should understand what's going on when they make, a, you know, a loud buzz about that. And, and then, oh gosh, the, um, we need to bit better understand that anger in them. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't think I could ever fully understand it unless I had a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis, quite honestly. However, I can understand the fear that's constantly in them and probably the anger that that drives to them. And so if they're driving out anger towards other, you know, earlier stages or other people, that to me is part of the disease and part of what's happening, you know, to them. So I think Jean had a really good point that we need to be empathetic and understand that they're dealing with so much more that we can't even begin to imagine of, of what that is. So yeah. I have to Hopefully. jump in and just say a few things yeah. and I'll, and then Jersey, but cause I think this is important because I think the other thing about many of those living with metastatic, and I know some of them are watching is they become almost doctors and scientists themselves. Mm -hmm. They become so knowledgeable how to search trials, how to, they're always having to think ahead. What's next, what's next. And it is a lot of work and it's really challenging, but they are, so many of those people can be so helpful to others because they have done the research themselves. And I see that happening in closed Facebook groups and our helpline in so many ways. Um, and I think the other misconception, and I'm sure you both feel this, is that so no one really gets that if breast cancer spreads to your liver, liver your lung, your bones, your brain, they think it becomes liver cancer. And and it's still breast cancer. So I, I do wish if we could educate that, that yes, breast cancer cells, um, it, that's what it is. Um, but these, I, I just think that the amount of work these advocates do, and I think for the doctors, um, it is so hard for them sometimes to have to share hard news that I'm sure they're, it would be a lot more on their plate to have to say to an early stage person, you know, you could become metastatic. So it, I do think they have a balancing act, but go ahead, Jersey. Um, yes, I had to educate my own family on when I got liver meds. I was like, no, I don't have liver cancer. I still have breast cancer. And then you have to educate them on like when your treatment, when that line of treatment stops working, you know, that now you're going to go on another one. And because I know about all the different um, treatments and the clinical trials and everything, but then you have to explain to your family, like this one stopped working, but like it's not, it's not the end of my life right now. Like there's another one. So we're constantly educating them and, and talking about it. And of course we have the, um, always have the fear. I, I don't, I don't have the angry part in me because I'm just like each day I'm alive. I'm happy to be alive. And each day I can inspire someone or educate someone or love on someone. I'm, I'm happy. Um, I, I don't have time for, to be angry, but I, I definitely get it because everybody's in their own space and has their, it's their right to feel however they want. If you want to ring the bell 20 times, let's ring it. <laughs> right. Right. Let's ring it, but, but understand what it right. means and doesn't mean, right. Um, yeah. That there's a way to, to celebrate the end of early stage treatment and to feel confident about the treatment and still to acknowledge that there's this whole other universe universe you may find yourself in and that there's a bunch of other people living in that universe that, um, you know, uh, for example, participated in clinical trials that made it possible for you to perhaps be cured at an early stage. Um, so there is so much um, kind of shared benefit. Um, there's one question in the chat here that I just, I think is a really good one and I wanna ask it, um, is, is what would you say to someone on the other side 
um, who does not want to hear what you have to say about your disease experience. So I think that can kind of go both ways, right? If you're an early stage person, what do you feel like the, your metastatic uh, sisters in arms um, don't want to hear about? And how do we kind of, and, and what about, uh, you know, do you find this, Marianne, you're, you're, when you're managing these groups and when you're in groups of women online or I don't know, in person as well, like, is there like, okay, there's, there are metastatic patients in this group and how do, how do they, do they try to kind of hold back? Do you, do you ever get the feeling about that? Like, how does this idea of, you know, what do the other folks on the other side not understand about my experience or are people less open to hearing um, about the other side and are people less open about sharing their experiences, not wanting to instill more fear or anxiety or be glib about anything? Like, what do you see? Oh. Yeah, so I believe that in my group, which is all stages, that the metastatic members take great care to not scare the other members, and and they do hold back. And then when they see things, you know, that, you know, just as a trigger for them, I know they're scrolling by, and they're not causing an explosive discussion to happen. And perhaps there's another option. Perhaps there is a gentle conversation so that it's a teachable moment, you know, and then maybe that that type of post wouldn't happen again. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's certainly something to, to think about going forward. Um, it, it's, it's just so difficult, right, to, to manage everything. But I think education and helping us connect those dots, you know, when we're not living that life, it, it, it we could be some formidable allies together. And then pushing out beyond the breast cancer community, how do we recruit allies, period, that are not even carrying this burden at all because we need more of them. I mean, it occurs to me also that I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people misunderstand uh, metastatic prostate cancer as well, or you know, <laughs> other cancers right. that um, where they begin um, may not kill you, but it's when they spread beyond um, where the real you know threat to your life is. There's just a great misunderstanding, I think, in the public about metastatic cancer in general. Um, it's not just with um, with breast cancer, but I I kind of expect that breast cancer because there's so many fierce advocates and it's such a common disease is probably the group that is going to push that forward in the public understanding beyond just breast cancer, just as you know, things like screening and chemo and surgery and all those things, the public learned about those things through breast cancer in a lot of ways. And maybe we'll see that as well with metastatic um, disease. Um, so there's so many questions in the chat and thank you so much to everyone um, for posting them. I'm just gonna uh, just give a quick look. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we're getting questions, um, you know, how can I meet or speak or hear someone with metastatic disease? How can I find these people and connect with them? And how do I learn more about metastatic breast cancer? What a great can question. I just yeah. take that yeah, quickly? So, geez, that's your yeah, for you, for um, sure. <laughs> I mean, there's so, so many ways, but, you know, at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, we have a program called Hear My Voice, where we train women and men living with metastatic breast cancer to find their voice, um, become advocates. They're very active in social media. Our blog is chock full of the lived experience stories of those living with breast cancer. There's Metaviver, an organization that amplifies the message as well as MedUp. Um, and yes, Komen is starting to do more for the metastatic community. So I think there's lots of ways to find resources. And, and I'm always amazed by those who are metastatic, what they endure, which I think is something to keep in mind is they, as Jersey said, she will be in treatment for the rest of her life. And sometimes, even though it's hopefully not that toxic as it is when you're treated with early stage, there can be really severe side effects and just the cumulative nature of being in treatment for so long um, causes so many side effects. So I think that this, this population really, um, you know, every day they're waking up and knowing I've got to face this. It's, it's, it's there. They can't just kind of put it away. Um, but we would love to tell, you know, come to lbbc.org. You'll find a lot of stories. <laughs> yeah, because it occurs to me that also that like a lot of the treatments that these, um, these folks are in in the metastatic community are similar to treatments that early stage patients are in as well. So there are same side effects. Uh, there are things to talk about. And when you, I think it was Jean, you mentioned that the 
metastatic patients often really become experts in their disease and know a lot about trials, about which doctors and which places are doing great work um, and can be great resources um, for, not that we wanna burden them further, they have a lot to handle already, but um, especially folks like Jersey and um, Leanne Kramer, who I wrote about in my book, folks that are really active in their own treatment, um, you know, learn a lot and, and I, I have found are just incredibly generous about sharing information. Um, yeah, there's, there was another question in the chat um, or in the Q&A. Uh, I have a friend recently diagnosed um, who won't get a second opinion. Um, do you have advice <laughs> um, for her? So this is another second opinion, so important at an early stage diagnosis. And if you receive a metastatic diagnosis, I, I think if that happened to me, I would probably want to seek out some additional uh, opinions, perhaps. Um, maybe not. Jersey, do you have thoughts on that? Um, oh, I, I got a second opinion when I was um, early diagnosed, when I was diagnosed metastatic, I didn't get a second opinion. But when I got liver mets, I got a second opinion. <laughs> yeah. Because I've never had traditional chemo. And when I got liver mets, for me, my own peace of mind, I needed to make sure that the, the treatment she was putting me on was the best treatment for me. So I went to Chapel Hill to for my own peace of mind. That's good. That's good. This is a, a place where I see in my group, the stage is coming together, where people will say, I don't know what to do. Here's what's happening, you know, with me. And I see a lot of our stage four members jumping in there and talking about those second, you know, opinions and why they're so valuable. And then also suggesting, you know what, this is who I know is in your subtype. That's an expert. Because as you've said, Jean, they know so much. They have to. Their life depends upon it because they have to help navigate their own protocols. So um, I, that's a beautiful way that that comes together in the group. But that's not understood well, that you can get a second opinion at any time during your experience. It doesn't have to be, well, it wasn't a diagnosis. I guess I missed the boat. You could do it at any time. Um, and someone, uh, I hope we can have just answer this quickly and come back on um, uh, just to wrap up a little bit. But another question that I think is important that I've heard from a lot of people is what do you do? Uh, this is in the Q&A sort of a form of this. Um, what are some ways to deal with survivor's guilt? I struggle with that sometimes, right? So let's say you join a support group of early stage folks and then inevitably, you know, some folks in that group end up with metastatic disease and, um, and may eventually pass away. Sort of how do you kind of cope with that from early stage? Is, is this something that you have come across and, and spoken to folks about? And um, what advice might you have for that? Um, Mary Ann, I, I, to hear from So you. this is my own personal experience. And yes, I, I've, I've dealt with people as well. But um, I, for the longest time, I had this, like, you know, I'm only stage one, you know, how did I get so lucky? And I didn't have to have chemo or radiation. And I kept using that word lucky in conjunction with my breast cancer diagnosis. And finally, my therapist said, listen, there is no luck if you've gotten breast cancer, that is not lucky period. And so anyone is allowed to have any reaction at any stage, you know, to what's happening to you. But the way that I help to manage like my fears and my anxiety is by helping others. And what I have found that it, it's a huge, powerful emotional healer is jumping in and helping others deal with what you have been through, or maybe you haven't gone through it quite yet yourself, but they need help. And you will find that what you get back from giving to them is probably more than they are receiving. And that's my, been my experience with um, running my group. So a yeah. call for getting involved in advocacy, which I'm sure Jean likes to hear uh, as well. Um, well, when I think about Survivor's Guild, I, I, you know, I, I think back to one of the original breast cancer advocates, a woman named Jane Reese Colborn, which I don't know if any of you knew, but um, she was diagnosed with metastatic in the 90s, was in a clinical trial. And for some reason, I think there were only six people in the trial. They all were, you know, died within the first year, she went on to live another 20 to 25 years and always felt like, why, why, why? And she went on to do so many things, you know, in advocating and she's just an incredible woman. Um, and that's the other thing to remember. There were so many amazing women that came before all of us um, who didn't make it, but I, we all really benefit from what each of us does. And so I think to what Marianne said, you know, whatever you can do to move this forward, so that the next generation, the next person diagnosed has it a little bit, has that road a little bit easier. But um, 
so anyway, I just remember her talking about that, but it didn't stop her. You know, it didn't make her feel guilty. Like she said, I'm going to just live as best I can. I'm going to do as much as I can. And, you know, if COVID's taught us anything is that nothing is certain and we really don't, we never knew what was going to happen. And now we all really know right. what's not going to happen. So in some ways you just got to embrace it. Yeah, because I think like, I understand the inclination of people wanting to put their cancer experience behind them, but it's always with you anyway, whether you kind of choose to talk about it or not. Um, So the idea of, you know, kind of being involved in meeting more people and staying in the community to whatever degree you feel comfortable, I think is really uh, important and a a great note um, for us to end on. Thank you so much um, to all the panelists and um, thank you, Kathy and Jean and Janine for inviting me to moderate this. Um, It was great to get to know you ladies a little bit and hopefully um, share some insights and information with the audience that will help them um, in their own lives.